Okay, um, welcome back. Um, before we continue, though, for those of you who joined a little late in the previous class, we were just talking about the assignment uh, that I posted last week. Um, so that's due today. I, I hope everyone has seen it on Google Classroom. Um, if you have not seen it, please go in. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to post it on Classroom and I'll respond there. Um, but um, I was just thinking that maybe I'll give you all an extra day to submit the work. So uh, I had said that it's due today, but you can submit it until tomorrow. Uh, and so I'm also grading based on timeliness of submission. So if you submit it uh, after tomorrow, then your grade will be cut a bit. Uh, you can see all the details of grading and all of that on Google Classroom. So yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to just post it on Classroom. Okay, so we'll continue from where we stopped. Um, we were discussing uh, chapter six, verses one to eight, right? Um, so here we see that these believers have uh, gone to a court of law, which uh, looks different from our present day courts of law, but uh, was similar in that they had gone to someone outside the church to judge a case for them and to tell them who was right, who was wrong, and how uh, they could find a just solution to their dispute that they had. And so uh, Paul says, how can you how can you go to someone outside uh, to give you a judgment about what is right and what is wrong? Uh, shouldn't you, as people of God, have enough wisdom to make a decision between yourselves, but you are going to an unbeliever uh, and asking them what is right and what is wrong. Um, so don't you have the ability to make that decision for yourselves? Uh, and then he goes on to say, don't you know that we will judge the world? And later on, he says, don't you know that we will judge even angels? Um, so there are a couple of references that uh, we will look at. Um, that talk about how we are given a place, a position of authority in Christ, how we share that throne with Christ. And so when we uh, are seated with Christ uh, in the heavenly realms, we share that responsibility uh, to an extent of judging the world. Um, so let's look at a few of these references. Um, Romans 8, 17 to 18, and Revelation 21, 7. And uh, maybe two people read those references. Romans 8, 17 to 18, and Revelation 21, 7. Romans 8, 17 to 18. And if children then hears, hears of God and join hears with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Thank you, Zen And uh, Revelation 21, 7. Uh, Revelation 21 7 He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Thank you, John. So here we see um, where we are co heirs with Christ. So we reign, uh, we reign with Christ, we share in the inheritance that is Christ, uh, and uh, we are heirs of God right um with christ we are heirs of god uh, 
we see in Ephesians 3, 8 to 11, someone can read that uh, passage. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 to 11. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so verse uh, 10 says, uh, His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So, um, so uh, Paul is talking about here uh, how the Gentile believers have now been brought into the body of Christ and now share in the inheritance that uh, before this only belonged to people of Israel. Uh, and so he's saying this wisdom of God uh, is being uh, revealed even to the, those in the heavenly realm, so uh, the angels. And uh, so we see here that um, there is a way in which uh, God's wisdom is revealed through us, through the church, to the angels. Um, we, in 1 Peter 1, it talks about how angels long to look uh, into God's plan for those who are redeemed. Um, and then uh, in several uh, several uh, books in Daniel, Matthew, Revelation talks about how we will reign with Christ and uh, be uh, ruling over or helping uh, in the administration of God's kingdom on earth. And so it's in reference to all of these things that Paul is saying, we have a place uh, to judge the world and uh, there's no specific reference where it says that we will judge angels, but these are the different ways in which uh, humans are lifted up or elevated to a place that is greater than angels in the, some of these verses that we saw. And so Paul is saying um, you have that kind of authority uh, and that kind of power in Christ, uh, but you are going to someone outside to teach you what is true, what is wrong, what is right, what is just. Uh, and so he is uh, calling us, calling those believers to recognize what is the kind of authority you have with Christ. And so if you have this kind of authority to judge the world, to judge angels, then shouldn't you be able to judge these small disputes that are arising within the church? Uh, shouldn't you have at least that much wisdom uh, and understanding. Uh, so then, uh, what is uh, what is the role of like a court of law now in our present day? Should we uh, depend on these courts, or should we be decision makers for ourselves? Uh, now we see that Paul also appealed to. Uh, the legal system when he was in uh, facing trial. So uh, Acts 22, 25, um, if someone can read that, we'll just look at that. Uh, 
Acts chapter 22, 25. Acts chapter 22, verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? So here we can see that Paul was appealing to the law. So the law protected him in that case. And so he was using uh, the law to uh, to defend himself. Uh, so uh, in other instances, we see where Paul appeals to Caesar and then he's sent to Caesar, right? Um, we see also in Romans uh, 13, where Paul talks about being submitted to uh, civil authorities because they have been placed in that position of authority by God. So there is definitely, uh, we give respect to people in authority and where there is opportunity for us to uh, get justice or uh, get fair treatment through the law that is uh, that we are subjected to in our countries, then we will take advantage of that and we will uh, use that uh, to protect ourselves. Uh, but here the issue is that there's a, there's a dispute within the church. So there are two people within the church who are disagreeing, right? So uh, this kind of thing between believers should be judged within the church. Uh, it shouldn't have to go to someone outside. It shouldn't go, have to go to someone who is a non-believer. Uh, he is saying he's encouraging us to resolve our issues within the church. And we see within scripture how we are to do that. Uh, in Matthew 18, 15 to 17, um, it talks about how, if you have a dispute with another believer, what should be your response and how do you come to a um, come to a place of agreement. Uh, so I'll just read from there, Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So uh, that is uh, that should be the process. We should be following uh, scriptures teaching on how we resolve disputes. The first thing is to address it with that person alone. If, uh, if you're able to resolve it between the two of you, then uh, your relationship is restored. But if uh, there is, if they are not willing to listen to what you have to say, then you take uh, two or more, uh, one or two more uh, witnesses with you who are part of the church so that they can uh, also hear what is being said and they can witness to whether what is being said is true, uh, witness to what the other person, how the other person is responding. So uh, once you do that, if there still is no resolution, then you bring it to the larger church. And if they're not willing to even listen to the larger church, then you consider them as an outsider, as an unbeliever. Okay. So here we see another example of um, someone being excluded from the body of Christ, where they are not willing to submit to uh, what, uh, what the church is saying should be done in a certain instance. Uh, so the main issue was that these believers were going to an unbeliever to resolve their issue. Uh, and Paul is saying, instead of going to someone outside, uh, instead of bringing uh, your disputes to the outside and shaming, like, you're shaming the church, right? We are called to be a people who uh, carry the glory of God. And uh, so when people look at us from the outside, they should uh, see us as people who are living lives that are, um, that are above the rest of the people around them. And so it should be something that is attractive to them. Uh, but if we display a lack of wisdom in the fact that we are not able to resolve our disputes, if we display uh, a lack of love for one another, the fact that we are uh, 
going to court against one another. Uh, if we uh, display uh, disputing to the extent that we want uh, someone else to, uh, we are cheating one another, right? We're wronging one another. If all of that is within the church, then what is going to attract an outsider to the church? Why will they uh, see the church as anything they want to be a part of? Um, so he says uh, here, instead of doing this, going to someone outside, why don't you just let yourself be cheated? It's better to uh, be cheated, to undergo injustice, uh, than uh, to go to someone outside with such a case. Uh, and he's saying what is worse is that it's not that you're letting yourself be cheated, it's that you yourselves are the ones who are cheating and wronging uh, each other. And that too, two people within the church. You're doing this to your own brothers and sisters. Uh, and so it's a really sad state of affairs within the church. Um, any questions on that? Before we go to the next part. Okay, so um, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So they were considered the unbelievers, right? A heathen is someone who doesn't believe in God, a tax collector is a sinner. So uh, the word tax collector was just used to refer to someone who's a sinner. So he's saying, let them be considered to you as someone who doesn't believe in God, uh, as someone who is uh, not part of this body of believers. So like they're saying, take that person out of the church in the previous passage, here it's saying, consider them as someone who is not part of the body of Christ, uh, because they're not willing to submit to what the body is saying is right. Uh, they're not submitting to the authority of the church. Um, so, uh, in both these passages, we see this, uh, what Paul is really doing is he's calling the church to holiness, right? Uh, to keep ourselves holy, to keep ourselves as people who are sanctified, who are set apart from the world around us. Uh, to be living lives that are completely different from what we see in the world around us. Uh, whether it be in the way we um, handle relationships or in the way we conduct ourselves in terms of uh, keeping from sin or keeping from allowing sin to be part of our fellowship. So we go on from there to verse, uh, verses 9 to 11. Somebody please read that. Um, chapter 6. Yes, chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Thank you. So uh, here we see Paul is again listing down um, some sins, right? So he's not list this, he can't say is the list of all the possible sins that people could commit. Uh, but he's saying those who are unrighteous will not inherit uh, God's kingdom. So before this, he's saying you wrong and cheat one another, uh, and you're doing this within the church to your own brothers and sisters. And then he's saying, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So in that context of wronging and cheating one another, uh, don't you know that if you continue in such unrighteousness, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he lists other uh, sins along with that kind of sin. Um, 
Uh, so let's just look at some of those. So he says uh, fornicators, so uh, people who are engaging in sexual sin and prostitution, uh, idolaters, people who are worshipping uh, false gods, um, adulterers, so people who are breaking their covenant of marriage and uh, having uh, sexual relations with those outside of their marriage covenant, homosexuals, so uh, uh, this will also refer to the male prostitutes that were there uh, in um, in the uh, religions that were around. Uh, sodomites, so this is also for homosexual practice or any other unnatural kinds of sexual practices. Uh, thieves, covetous people, so people who are greedy, uh, drunkards, revilers, people who are abusive, or extortioners, people who cheat people uh, or uh, try to steal money from people. So uh, a lot of different sins covered there. And then uh, he goes on to say uh, that there is no place for these kinds of people in God's kingdom. Uh, and then he says, but don't you know who you really are? You are people who are washed. You are people who are sanctified. You are people who are justified in the name of Jesus and by God's spirit. So this is your true identity. And if this is your identity, then there, there is no place for sin in you because uh, that should be foreign to you as a people who are washed, sanctified, justified. Right? Uh, so um we we'll, there are lots of verses uh, that are stated here we won't read all of these verses uh but when it's talking about being washed it says uh, a person who is it's talking about a physical cleansing but obviously a cleansing of our hearts of our consciences uh being sanctified is to be set apart um, so to be used only for God's purposes, uh, to be made holy and useful for God. Uh, to be justified is to be said to be righteous in God's eyes. So uh, before God, we are righteous. God sees us as righteous. Um, and so that is something for us to claim as our identity, uh, to say, I have been washed. I have been sanctified, I have been justified, I have been made clean, I've been made holy, I've been made righteous in Jesus' name and by the Spirit of God. And so there is no place for uh, sin to exist in our lives or within the body of Christ uh, because it's so outside of these things. Uh, it's, it's a contrast to our true identity in Christ. Uh, we go on to verses 12 to 20. Did somebody read that, please? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Thank you, John. So uh, here we see Paul going back to the issue of uh, sexual immorality. Uh, 
So he starts with that initially, where he is talking about the man who is uh, uh, sleeping with his father's wife. And then he goes into uh, this other thing of disputes within the church. Now he's coming back to sexual sin here. And uh, the first verse, uh, verse 12, he says, uh, all things are lawful for me. So uh, this is a kind of argument uh, that people would have, right? It's okay for me to do this. It's not uh, wrong for me to do this, so I can do it. Uh, but he's saying, even if it's not wrong, it may not be helpful for you. And if it's not helpful, uh, if it's not helpful, it's better not to do it. And then uh, if even if it's not wrong, if you're being brought under its power, right? So if it's going to have some kind of power over you and you're going to be in bondage to it, then, uh, then don't do it. Uh, now, on the other hand, what is lawful or what is legal may not always be what is moral. Uh, which is a, a sad thing, right? Sometimes the law allows things that are immoral. So we do not follow uh, what is legally okay. We're not trying to uh, just follow the law of the world. We are trying to follow God's law, and God's law is moral. So that's where we get our moral standards from. So in that culture, um, if uh, certain signs of uh, certain things were not considered uh, wrong, like uh, being with a prostitute was not considered wrong. It was law. It was legal to be with a prostitute, but according to God's law, it is immoral. It's wrong. So uh, to say that it's legal for me to do it, so I can do it, is not uh, a good argument uh, if you belong to the church, right? So the uh, we will follow the morality of God, we will follow the law of God. And so he says, even if it's legal, if it's not helpful and it's going to put you under bondage, uh, under some kind of bondage, then don't engage in it. Uh, verse 13, foods with the stomach and the stomach for foods. So uh, this was a common uh, view uh, in that culture and uh, among some philosophers where they thought that Stomach is just for food, uh, and food is just for the stomach. So they're taking that same kind of thinking to the body, and they're saying, uh, so the body is for sex, and sex is for the body. OK, so uh, and their view was that at the end of our lives, we're going to die, and our bodies are going to die with us. That's the end of life. Uh, so, so it doesn't make a difference. We can do whatever we want with our bodies. Right, so he's saying, uh, but as a believer, your body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for your body. So your body no longer belongs to you, and you can't just do whatever you want with your body. Um, and this body is not only for this life, but it will be raised up, uh, just as Christ's body was raised up, and will be raised up in power, so verse 14. God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So uh, we are going to be raised up to eternal life. Uh, then on to the next verse, verse 15. Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? So uh, now he's taking this uh, very, they did not respect or honor their bodies, their physical bodies as something uh, that should be uh, that should be treated with reverence, right? So he is assigning reverence to our physical bodies in this verse fifteen. Our bodies are members of Christ. Members of Christ is say it's uh, like a like it's a part of the body of Christ. So we can't take some parts of our bodies and join them to someone who is unholy, right? Uh, join them to a prostitute. Because in doing that, we are becoming one with that person. Uh, he goes back to Genesis, uh, uh, talking about uh, the covenant of marriage, where the two shall become one flesh. So in the Old Testament, when it's talking about sex, it's pretty much assigning sex to marriage, right? When you have sex with someone, you are actually uh, committing yourself to that person in marriage. Um, so there was no difference between the two. It was not like sex was one thing and marriage was another thing. 
when you come, uh, when you have sex, you become one flesh with the person. And so he's saying that uh, in this context, when you uh, have sex with a prostitute, you are becoming one with that person. And so you cannot become one with someone who is engaging in sin if you are part of the body of Christ. If your body belongs to Christ, then you cannot also be uh, taking that same body and becoming one with someone uh, who is sinful. Okay, so if we are one with Christ, we cannot also be one with sin or one with a sinner. Uh, verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So it's not only one flesh, but also one spirit. So uh, our, uh, our nature within should be sanctified and one with Christ. So that's why he says there is no place for sin in us. Because if we are one with Christ, uh, sin cannot be a part of who we are. Uh, verse 18, free sexual immorality, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So uh, because um, sex is such a uh, intimate thing and it is that process of uh, being made one with someone, he's saying this sin is very different from other kinds of sin. In this sin, you are actually committing your whole body into that sin and your whole body becomes part of that uh, act of sin that you are committing. Uh, verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So earlier we saw how he was talking about the church being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to the individual person. And he's saying you as a believer, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So before we're talking about keeping the, uh, the church of Christ holy and pure and sanctified, now we're talking about keeping our own bodies pure and holy uh, and free from sin. There's no place for sin in the body of a believer. Uh, verse 20, we were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So uh, both our body and spirit belong to God. And so God should be glorified in both. Okay, And uh, why he should be glorified in both is that uh, Christ, uh, Christ's life was given for uh, to buy us back to God. So that was the price that was paid for us. Okay, so um, we were redeemed through the blood of Christ. That was paid as a ransom for our, uh, for us to be bought back and to be restored to God and to that image of God that is within us, to that holy uh, image that God had. Put in us. Um, any questions on whatever we talked about so far? Okay. Um, let me just see. Covered everything that was important to cover. Okay. Uh, I think this is really helpful. Um, verse 18, where it talks about flee sexual immorality. Uh, every sin that a man commits is outside his body. So uh, that word flee is to escape, to run away, to go to a place of safety. Okay, So to run away from uh, any danger to a place of safety. And I think that is uh, the best advice you can get when it comes to sexual sin. Uh, that there is no place for staying there and trying to address what is happening or trying to navigate the situation. The best thing to do is to run away from it and then to think about, okay, how do we deal with what uh, what was happening or what was going to happen? Uh, 
Okay, because uh, it's too easy to fall into sin if you remain in that place. Um, so just an important word when when there is temptation to sexual sin to first uh, take yourself away from that situation to a place of safety and then after that deal with whatever else needs to be dealt with. Um, okay, so we finished till verse 20. Okay, so um, there are a few things that we can declare over ourselves to uh, just remind ourselves of of the truth of God's word and to keep away from sexual sin. Uh, there are eight points that are mentioned. Um, I think this is on page 57. Can you all see that? If you all have that open, uh, then we will uh, just make those declarations uh, together over our bodies. Um, so yeah, verse uh, from 1 to 8. I have been washed, made clean, sanctified, made holy, and justified, made righteous in Jesus' name and by the Spirit of God. The second one, I live by what pleases God and not by popular opinion. I will not be brought under the control of anything displeasing to God. The third one, my body is not for sexual sin. My body is for the Lord and the Lord is for my body. I consecrate all my appetites, passions and affections to the Lord. Uh, the fourth one, my body is part of the body of Christ. I refuse to allow my body to partake in sexual sin. Christ is revealed and expressed through my body. Fifth one, I'm spiritually one with Jesus. He is in me. I am in him. All that is mine is his. I live my life out of my union with him. Sixth, I run from all sexual sin. Seven, my body is holy. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit and it's a dwelling place of God. And eight, my body is not mine. My spirit, soul, and body have been bought with the blood of Jesus and belong to God. So these are just some helpful declarations based on all the things that Paul talks about in this uh, in this passage, uh, to keep ourselves from falling into sexual sin and keeping ourselves pure. Okay, we will uh, move on to chapter seven. Okay, now uh, chapter seven uh, talks about sex within marriage. Uh, it talks about the gift of singleness. Uh, it talks about staying in your marriage. Uh, or and then after that, staying where you were called, uh, then talks about what was Paul's primary objective uh, when he was serving God. And then the last is the higher happiness of singlehood, which is being dedicated to God. So uh, we'll see in chapter seven that he continues to talk about uh, about uh, sex, but here he's talking about it in the context of being married and being single. Um, shall, can somebody read verses one to six, please? Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. 
and likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self control but i say this as a concession not as a commandment for i wish that all men were even as i myself but each one has his own gift from god one in this manner and another in that but i say to the unmarried and to the widows it is good for them if they remain even as i am but if they cannot exercise self control let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion thank Should you yeah we can stop it so um so here uh after talking about sexual immorality he's bringing it to sex in the context of marriage right so again here in verse 1 he refers to a letter that they had sent to him the corinthians had sent to him and he's talking about a specific question that they asked about whether a man can touch a woman now uh, touch again is implying a sexual kind of uh, relationship not like just physically touching uh, someone a uh, man just physically touching a woman uh, so he is saying it's better uh, for that not to happen if it's possible uh, stay away from sexual relationships but Uh, because there is the temptation to sexual immorality uh it's better to if you have that kind of desire then it's better to just get married so that you're able to express that desire in a context that is uh that is godly and that god approves of right so uh, we all have natural desires that uh that are god given and there are god given ways to express those desires so instead of uh, trying to withhold ourselves from marriage and then burning with that desire because it's not being fulfilled it's better to then to have to get married and be able to have that desire fulfilled in a way that is approved by god um So verse 3 says let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. So uh this is something where we are uh, it's a mutual giving of one self to each other. Uh but that word render uh doesn't mean that we are only giving it for the sake of the other but it is that you also in the process benefit you are also uh, receiving some kind of benefit through that giving of yourself um, and affection so it says render affection right so the affection refers to goodwill or kindness so in that act of sex you're also not only expressing affection but it's also goodwill and kindness towards your spouse uh, so you are extending that uh, in through the act of sex um and the word affection due to your spouse so the word due is a greek word called ophelo and it means what is owed or a debt that is to be paid so this is something that we owe to our spouse right when we are um, when we are getting married or when we are uh, making our vows we are committing ourselves to one another and one of the things that we are committing to the other person is that we will give our bodies to the other person uh because uh in that we are fully uh, expressing what marriage is right it is a coming together of two people uh not only uh in our bodies but also uh in all other ways uniting uh, under god's authority and so one of the ways is in the form of sex and so uh, it is a duty in that sense that we give ourselves to this to our spouses uh verse 4 
uh, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So uh, again, this is uh, where we've given, we've surrendered our bodies to one another. And so we don't claim authority over our own bodies. Uh, we give our bodies over to our spouse uh, to say that you now have authority over my body and I have authority over your body. We are so fully given over to each other and submitted to one another uh, in this context of sex. Um, but in that, as we give ourselves over to one another, uh, we treat each other's bodies with reverence. So uh, it should not be that we take authority and we uh, take it to the extent where we abuse uh, that person physically. Uh, rather, when, that, when our bodies are given over to each other, we respect and we honor one another's bodies. Verses 5 to 6. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time uh, so that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I see this as a concession, not as a commandment. Uh, so here is if you choose to withhold uh, sex from one another, if you choose to uh, stay apart for some point of time because you want to spend some time in fasting and prayer uh, you can do that but don't do it to the extent that uh, it becomes a place where satan can tempt you and uh, you fall into sin as a result so do it with wisdom recognizing okay uh, to this extent we can make this sacrifice but where it becomes uh, an issue of sin or temptation uh, then it's time to uh, to be able to go back and be with one another so that we do not fall into sin. Uh, so it should always be uh, mutually agreed on. So when we abstain from sex, it should be something that both the husband and wife agree on and they agree on uh, to do it for a specific period of time. Uh, it should never be that one person has made the decision and is withholding sex from the other person. And it should never be used as a way of controlling the other person. Uh, so uh, in uh, in the marriage counseling course that we have uh, through the church, that is one thing that is addressed as uh, people are preparing to get married. Never withhold sex uh, to control your spouse say okay because you're not doing this uh i'm not going to uh i'm not going to come to bed with you so that kind of thing is uh, misusing sex and it's uh dishonoring of this gift that god has given you right so like we read before this your body doesn't belong to you it belongs to your spouse and so you don't have the right to uh, withhold it withhold it from your spouse uh, so that is a good way to look at it uh, in terms of honoring uh, one another and in terms of submitting to one another in this act of sex. Um, so we won't go into the next part because we just have one minute left. That, that is the part on singleness. Um, but we can close for now unless anyone wants to say anything, or has a question, anything needs to be addressed. Okay, there's nothing we close for this week. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, just a reminder to go back to the classroom and uh, turn in your assignments and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.